Welcome back to Backpacking Sucks. Today we're talking about how all the aches and pains of backpacking suck and what we can do about them. Y'all already know the deal about this series by now, so let's just get into it. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss the rest of the series. One of the most common backpacking pains is blistered. With an activity that requires you to constantly be on your feet, it's obviously a huge bummer when your feet are covered in blisters. They suck. I've heard so many different ways that people deal with blisters and have attempted many of them myself, so I'm going to list those here. First of all, your shoes are extremely important. Getting shoes that fit properly is one of the best ways that you can prevent blisters. If your shoes are too big or too small, blisters will probably develop. It also helps a lot to wear your shoes before you go on long trips so your feet can get used to whatever shoes you're going to be in day in and day out. There might be a few hot spots that maybe could develop a blister or over time just a callus if your feet are already used to it. But I would recommend trying to find shoes that don't have those spots of irritation. You also wanna keep in mind that your feet may swell while backpacking and you wanna size them to potentially accommodate for that. And sometimes that's hard to do before you ever test them out. So it might be good to take them out on shorter trips before you go out for a longer one. You also might wanna consider specific shoes for specific environments, like shoes that won't let in too much sand if you're in the desert because that can cause blisters. But you also wanna be careful to make sure your shoes are breathable in other environments. It's a hard balance to strike sometimes. Socks can also make a really big difference in blisters. If you find that you're getting a lot of in between the toe blisters, you can try sock liners that have the toe holes. Liner socks in general can be a great thing to try if you're getting a lot of blisters to help reduce that friction between your foot and the shoe. That said, in the desert, you also don't want too many layers on your feet because then they might start sweating, which can also cause blisters. Sometimes I even bring thinner socks specifically for the desert than I do on higher alpine trips. And like we said, since sweat can cause blisters, that's another reason that I personally prefer breathable trail runners over something like waterproof boots. I also try to air my feet out at lunch breaks and things so that I can get everything to dry out even if my feet do sweat during the day. Gaiters can also be really helpful for keeping the blister causing debris out of your shoe. So you can add those to your foot setup on trail and try to remember to dump out your shoes on breaks and when you're airing your feet out. Luco tape, as I've mentioned in videos before is one of my favorite ways to treat hot spots or blisters. If I catch a hot spot early enough or know that there's a problem area on my foot, I like to cover that up with Luco tape to help prevent that blister from ever forming. And if it has already turned into a blister, I'll put gauze in between the Luco tape and my foot so that the Lugo tape isn't directly on the blister. If the blister is already open, I might also add some Neosporin to that combination. I will say, as I've said before, to be very careful with Lugo tape on your bare, especially weakened skin. So like if the blister is already forming or already there, be really careful not to put the Lugo tape directly on it because then when you go to take it off, it's so adhesive that it might pull that skin off with it. I also like to wait a few days before trying to take Lugo tape off for the same reason. Moleskin is another thing that I see a lot of hikers using. It's not something that I personally use often or have found much success with. I prefer Lugo tape in this instance. I have heard people having success with it, using it to keep um, pressure off like the hot spots and blisters. You can kind of, it's a really like thick kind of material that you can sort of cut a hole the shape of your blister out of and you put the moleskin around it from my understanding. And then that way it keeps that sensitive spot from rubbing. Um, one thing you could try to do is put moleskin underneath Lugo tape as well to sort of keep the pressure off of an already formed blister. But I find that gauze works just as well for that for me. Band-aids are obviously another solution. If you don't have Lugo tape or moleskin, you can use them for sure in a pinch. I just find that I have to replace band-aids over and over and over again throughout the day. They're nice if like they're the easiest thing to access or something, but especially within my shoes, I find that band-aids just don't stay put. Finally, Vaseline. I've encountered a few hikers who will just slather Vaseline all over their feet. Um, and this seems to be a helpful method for preventing blisters. I personally just can't get past having Vaseline all up inside my socks. So again, not something I've tried, but something that you could. Next up is chafing, the bane of a backpacker's existence. This might be the suckiest part of this whole series. I'm really not sure if there's anything that sucks more than chafing. And if you've experienced it, I feel like you'll be with me on that one. I specifically deal with chafing mostly between my thighs and between my butt cheeks, which I feel like is maybe the worst kind. And chafing is another thing that I've seen all types of backpackers deal with in all types of different ways. So I'll share as many of the tips as I can remember or find helpful here. 
First, chafing is usually caused by the friction between either skin to skin contact or between your clothes and your skin. Having clothing that fits in specific ways can really go a long way to prevent chafing, I think. One of the worst chafes that I ever got while through hiking, wearing my normal hiking shorts under like sort of saggy rain pants while it was really humid. Between the moisture and where like the crotch of the rain pants were hitting my regular hiking shorts, it created this like awful trifecta of a lot of friction and led to really terrible chafing. I could have prevented this with either longer shorts or rain pants where the crotch wasn't so low, so it wasn't hitting at the same exact spot as my shorts. But by the time I realized what had happened, it was already too late. As a lady whose thighs do touch while I hike, I prefer to wear biker shorts or like any kind of short that has spandex underneath that go a little bit longer than like your typical running short. I have friends that will wear leggings or pants while they're hiking for this same reason. When you're picking out clothing, you just wanna keep an eye on where the seams hit and make sure that that won't also contribute to chafing. If the seams are hitting right where your thighs are rubbing together, that can be a recipe for disaster. The seams in underwear have also caused chafing for me while backpacking and the best solution that I've found for that is honestly just wearing seamless underwear. My personal favorite is not like a techie brand at all, but it's the Auden underwear from Target. If you're in like a drier environment or not sweating as much, it's maybe not as important, but I've found that in hotter environments, this is really important for me. This next one might sound weird, but bear with me. I promise it works really well. And that's using either diaper rash cream or Vagisil for chafing. I actually learned about the Vagisil from my friend Twerk and he absolutely swears by it. I was a little skeptical at first, but once I tried it, I understood the hype. I use them both for like once I start to feel chafing to sort of provide like extra protection and glide for wherever the problem area is. I also use them for once the chafing has already kind of happened and to provide a little bit of relief at nighttime when I'm trying to sleep. Next, body glide or Vaseline. I hear both of these options from people quite a lot, but personally I find that the Vagisil and diaper rash cream work a lot better, but body glide or Vaseline can be great options if that's all you can find or all that you have on hand to sort of, again, alleviate um, the friction in that problem area to try and prevent the chafing from happening. You just wanna make sure if you're using these that you are letting that area dry out at night because moisture is what contributes to chafing as well. So you don't want it to be staying moist constantly. You wanna let it dry out so it can heal. Aloe vera and healing lotion are also something that you can apply once you've allowed the area to dry. So maybe you've sat at camp for a little while, it's dried out, and then you want something to put on it at night so that it heals a little bit faster or you can relieve some pain and that's where aloe vera or healing lotion would come in. Finally, baby powder can be a great tool to help prevent chafing. If you're getting it and you have a suspicion that it's because of the moisture in a specific spot, you can add baby powder to sort of dry it out and help again prevent all of that friction that's happening in, in whatever area you're dealing with the chafing. Ladies, just be careful not to use anything with talc in it, although I don't think that they even make baby powder with talc anymore, but something to keep an eye out for. But in summary, my personal holy grail combo for dealing with chafing is one, seamless underwear, two, longer spandex shorts, three, Vagisil. If I have those three things, I, no joke, don't feel like I need anything else. Another thing that can really suck to deal with while backpacking is sunburn. Especially if you spend an afternoon relaxing shirtless at an alpine lake and all of a sudden have to carry 30 pound pack on sunburned shoulders. Best way to deal with sunburns, of course, is to not get them in the first place. And in order to avoid sunburns to begin with, here's what I do. And next up, I'll talk about what happens if you goof. First, I've sang their praises many a time on this channel, but I can't say enough good things about sun umbrellas. They make being in the shade a permanent reality and possibility, even when there are no trees around. Next is protective clothing. So sun hoodies, sun gloves, pants, hats. The more skin that is protected by UPF fabric, the better off you're going to be. And the less sunscreen you have to remember to apply. I also like to keep sunscreen in my fanny pack or hip belt, whatever I have, and in my pack. If I keep a small tube in my fanny pack, I'm much more likely to reapply it throughout the day and I can even reapply it to like my face and stuff while I'm walking versus having to take off my pack and put on the sunscreen. Sometimes reducing just that little bit of extra friction means that you're gonna reapply more often. 
and also apply sunscreen early and often. I apply sunscreen every morning as part of my like leaving camp routine. And that's when I use the big tube that's in the back of my backpack. If you make it a specific part of your routine, you're less likely to forget. And I try to also reapply it every break. I know we don't live in a perfect world and I have made the mistake before. I'm sure many of you have made the mistake before of roasting the shit out of yourself on a backpacking trip. So what do you do then? First, aloe vera is going to be the best thing that you can do for yourself in the short term. Sometimes that's hard if you didn't think ahead to pack it out, but try and pick some up when you're in town. Next time you get to town, maybe try and get to town a little bit early if you can to get yourself some relief. Next, it's really important to stay hydrated. Once you have burned your body, you are going to be going through liquids a lot faster and you wanna make sure that you're keeping fluids in your system. Next, don't forget to keep applying sunscreen. Don't just give up because you're already like burnt to a crisp. You can make it worse. So try and keep reapplying sunscreen even if you are already very burnt. If it's really bad, you can try taking some pain relievers to deal with the pain. But remember, this is not medical advice. Always talk to a doctor. Especially when backpacking out west, I tend to dry out a lot. This can lead to some painful things like cracked skin and chapped lips, which suck. One of the most painful things that has ever happened to me while backpacking was my legs cracking open on the CDT after going in and out of the Gila so many times. I think the combination of that and the dry air just dried the skin out on my legs so badly that they started to literally crack open. Open. And that was a nightmare to deal with. But here's some of the ways that I deal with dry skin and chapped lips while backpacking. First, sunscreen chapstick during the day. This is super important to keep your lips from getting burnt, which will make them burn a lot and crack open a lot more. Second, using Aquaphor on your lips at night. This combination I think is like the perfect lip health while on trail, because Aquaphor, I swear, heals me immediately. Third, I know it might seem like a luxury item, but I've definitely carried out lotion when I'm backpacking in really dry environments. You can pack a little tube if you've been drying out a lot or use sunscreen with moisturizer in it so that you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. Fourth, something that I learned the hard way on the Gila was to avoid going in and out of water frequently if you can. Obviously in that scenario, I really couldn't do anything about it, but if you notice your legs are really, really dry, maybe avoid the Alpine Lake that day as much as that pains me to say. Finally, diaper rash cream, in addition to being good for chafing, can be really nice to relieve dry skin. I did learn the hard way that diaper rash cream mixed with dirt turns into something resembling concrete. So my advice would be to only only apply this at night once you're done hiking because I tried putting diaper ash cream on my cracked legs in the Gila and it definitely made it feel a lot better but like I said it just mixed with the dirt and then when I had to take it off that night to get into my sleeping bag, it was almost impossible. Injuries are of course one of the most prevalent pieces of this category and can be, in my opinion, up there with chafe and their level of suck. They may even make me eat my words for calling chafing the suckiest because injuries at best are incredibly inconvenient and at worst potentially hike or trip ending. For me personally, sustaining an injury either from falling or freak accident or overuse on the PCT it was one of my biggest fears before I started backpacking and still is an anxiety that is hard for me to quell at times. There are a few things that you can implement to prevent injuries, which again, like sunburns, I think is the best approach try and stop it before it happens. But I'll also talk about, again, how to deal with them if they do happen. First, for injury prevention, here are some things that I try to do on every trip. First, don't have too heavy of a pack. I'm not here to advocate for being extremely ultra light. I don't think it needs to be anything crazy. Just make sure that you're within the reasonable amount of pack weight for someone your size. I think the typical rule is 20% of your body weight, but I do feel like that that's a little bit heavy, especially over longer mileages. I would say try and keep your base weight at around 15 or lower. And in my experience, you're gonna be much less likely to deal with overuse injuries. Second, wear the right shoes. It can be really hard to find the shoes that work for you. In my opinion, I think the best thing you can do is go to a running store or a foot specific shoe store, like where they'll actually look at your gait and the shape of your foot and everything and pick out a shoe that's specific to you. I think everybody has favorite types of shoes for different reasons and it's great to get recommendations, but Really at the end of the day, it's about your foot shape and your gait, and that's gonna make the biggest impact on what shoe makes the most sense for you. And like I said before, it's also important to get your feet used to whatever shoes you're gonna be using before you leave. You don't wanna to switch to zero drop shoes and wear them for the first time on the first day of your through hike. That is a recipe for disaster. Third is train. I've done a whole video about this, but this one is honestly saying that you can just train while you're on your through hike, sort of ramp up the mileage, and yeah, that can work, but I think that strength training 
in no way is going to hurt you and can only really help you. And in the long run, I think would prevent more injuries than just starting and ramping up your mileage slowly because there are all sorts of tendons and muscles and things that you just want to get in good shape that that are going to set you up for success on your through hike. There's also through hikes where that time window doesn't really allow you to start super slow. So you don't want to just be diving into 15 mile days without preparing your body. Same thing goes for if you only have a limited time where you have PTO. You don't want to go from the couch to backpacking 10 miles, 15 miles a day. Your body's going to be better set up for success if you've trained a little bit. Also start slow. I know I kind of just said this isn't always possible, but you don't want to jump into like 30 mile days the first couple weeks of your through hike. It's definitely easy to get swept up in the excitement of a trip, but try and ease your body into things. If you do find yourself in the unfortunate situation of having sustained an injury, there are a few things that you can do about it. First, I am a huge fan of physical therapy. It saved my through hike of the PCT in 2019 when I got this really bad overuse injury in my knee. I went to a PT in Bend and they were able to give me exercises and do some massage and tape me up. And while my knee was definitely not at 100%, I was able to actually hike, which was vastly different from how I arrived in Bend. I also wanna give a shout out to Blaze Physio at Blaze Physio on Instagram. And you can look up her website, Blaze Physio. This is not a paid shout out. I just happened to have gone to her and really enjoyed my experience. She is a through hiker and PT dedicated to helping through hikers specifically. So she's really familiar with the common injuries that we might have and has virtual appointments available. She also travels along the PCT right now um, to help hikers out in the beginning of their hike. So she might be in your area, but also the online appointments are definitely available to everyone no matter where you are. I specifically went to her for a sprain that I had in my foot from playing rec volleyball and wanting to start my 50K training soon. And she was super helpful and I'm excited to hopefully keep getting better and not have to deal with that injury all summer. She's truly not paying me to say these things. I'm just stoked that something like this exists for through hikers because I think PT can be such a positive way to deal with injuries while still getting to hike. An injury doesn't always mean that you have to quit the trail. That being said, sometimes rest is the best thing for you. I know rest can be one of the hardest things for us backpackers and through hikers to do, but if you start to feel an injury coming on on a long hike, maybe give yourself an extra day in town. It's not worth pushing yourself super hard through something if maybe a day of rest is all it needs to sort of calm down. A small injury can definitely turn into a bigger one if you push it too far. That's where something like the help of an expert comes in amazingly because they can tell you, oh, this is something you can hike through or, oh, this is something that you should give a little bit of time before it turns into something much worse. As a sort of addendum to taking rest days, I would recommend to try and budget some rest time into your overall through hike time plan. If you already have those potential rest days budgeted in, you won't be as nervous about taking that time off. You'll be like, oh, well, I already kind of planned for this. So this works out. You wanna make sure you have that buffer built in both time-wise and financially. Semi-related to injuries, one of the persevering pains and sucky parts of backpacking is foot pain. I'm not talking about like foot injuries specifically, just the persistent ache that you get from walking for miles and miles and miles on end with weight on your back. For me, this always picks up on especially rough terrain and is specifically worse when my shoes are kind of nearing their last leg. Like it's almost time to replace them, but not quite. And it's always worse at the end of the day. So here is how I deal with the dreaded through hiker foot ache. And I'm curious to see how many of you have this experience as well. First, I put my feet up. Usually while I'm resting, I'll set my pack out and try and put my foam pad against a tree or something, and then put my feet up on my pack to rest while I'm breaking. Second, I take my shoes off and I will massage my aching feet at breaks. This provides some temporary relief. Third, I will soak my feet in cold streams to help kind of reduce the inflammation and just make them feel a little bit better for a little while. Fourth, I try to sleep with my feet uphill if I'm on like a slightly sloped campsite, or I will put my pack under my feet to elevate them at night to again help with the swelling. I will also take turmeric to help with inflammation. This is an anecdotal experience, but I felt like on the CDT when I was taking turmeric, I definitely relied less on ibuprofen. Finally, if they're aching so badly that I can't fall asleep, I will take ibuprofen to fall asleep. Again, talk to a doctor always before taking medication. And if none of that is helping, I cave and I get new shoes early if I need to, or I've also been looking into more cushiony shoes. Switching to Hoka's has been really nice for me. Um, again, everybody's foot is different, but I've been really enjoying the cushion that's in my Hoka's. However, I haven't done any days over 30 miles since getting them. So 
I will report back once I do. Thank you so much for listening to me complain about backpacking yet again. If you haven't seen the first two in the series, be sure to go watch those. And remember, I make new backpacking videos every Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe. If you have any venting you'd like to do or any suggestions you'd like to leave, please do so in the comments. Thank you for watching. Bye.